it is. In the precise language of the engineer, it's called the jet propulsion gas turbine. To you and me, it's the jet engine, one of the marvels of this century of marvels. When they start it up, stand back. Its deep-throated voice will climb to the shrieking of a thousand fiends. Its flaming breath is white-hot gas fed by drafts of liquid fuel. Watch that gallon go. And all around, the straining fury of its power sets the very air a shudder. Here is the inside story. Air and fuel ignited in combustion chambers, and the resulting gas ejected through a jet pipe at the rear. Now, in the path of the rushing gas, insert a bladed wheel, a turbine. Link the turbine to a powerful fan, so placed as to ram the air into the combustion chambers under pressure. Let the gas dry the turbine and the fan. Under fierce compression, the temperature rises, and the expanding gas roars from the jet pipe with tremendous force. This is the turbine jet, the power that is driving the fighters of today through the sonic barrier. Now on the forward end of the shafting system, mount an air screw. Here is another new means of propulsion, the turbine propeller. The engine that is opening fresh vistas of simplicity, efficiency, speed. To the British aircraft industry, the turbine jet and the turbine propeller engines have brought a golden opportunity. Says the Dean of British Air Designers, Charles Clement Walker. In this new form of air travel, Britain has the chance to make up the leeway lost in the war when we were developing combat aircraft to the exclusion of all else. In many a research center, they are grappling with the special problems posed by the enormous power of the jet. And as Britain's new prototypes take shape, planes which many believe will give her a leading edge in the competition of the sky, a glimpse of the future they are heralding is given by the well-known airline executive, Peter Macefield. At a speed of 2,000 miles an hour, which is at least in sight, the journey from London to New York could be completed non-stop in about two hours. And of course, New York time is five hours back on London time. Passengers could leave London after lunch, say at two o'clock in the afternoon, and arrive in New York for an 11 o'clock coat the same morning. So as far as the clock goes, they would arrive three hours before they started. No wonder that amid such promise of adventure, the rising generation should desert all loyalties to the footplate and the fire brigade, should crane its neck skyward to the streaking silver that bespeaks tomorrow. Pleasure to meet you. Look, I ain't only six to no wonder, too, that the eerie whistle of the jet should have brought a mysterious jargon all its own to the language of the engineer. Well, with a tubular type heat exchanger, to get the air you want a lot of tubes and consequently the inside diameter of the tubes are very small. Consequently, the overall power output will go down, just like this. It began in the year 1926. Remember, 1926 when the symbol of Great Britain was a famous bowler hat, when America stood silent at Valentino's grave, when Suzanne Longlong was queen of the center court at Wimbledon, when Donahue was booting home the winners. 
In that year, at the Royal Air Force College at Cranwell, there was a young cadet who had been interested in aircraft since the tender age of three. His name, Frank Whittle. Now in his 19th year, Cadet Whittle wrote a thesis. His idea was not new. 2,000 years ago, Hero of Alexandria had thought of it. Later in the pages of history, Newton had given it his passing attention. But Whittle believed that this idea could fly. It was fortunate indeed that Whittle's notions should gain the sympathetic ear of his instructor, Flight Lieutenant Patrick Johnson. Doubly fortunate that Johnson happened to be well acquainted with the world of patents. That's right. Well, come and tell me about it. I haven't got time now. Yes, oh, certainly. Fine. Well, look. <clears throat> this represents a centrifugal type compressor, like an enlarged supercharger. I use this to pull in air at the front and to compress it into combustion chambers, like this, where the injection and burning of fuel heats and expands the air and gives it enough energy to drive a turbine, which drives the compressor, after which the air still has enough energy to give a high-velocity propelling jet. Have you ever patented anything? No. I don't know a thing about it. Does a patent both publish and protect? That is the whole point of patents. But one thing is essential. File a patent application before touting the thing round. Otherwise, you haven't a hope. I'll tell you what. Let's rough out a specification now. Well, what? Fine. What do we do? Well, you make a rather better sketch, and I'll get on with the clever bit, the writing. OK. And so, with the specifications of an idea tucked under his arm, Johnson walked through London's stately Inns of Court to the patent office. On his way, he glanced into the library, that famous library where the walls are lined with dreams, illustrious, unknown, crazy. Would this dream fade, forgotten too? Or might it usher in a revolution in technology? In the county of Leicestershire stands the town of Lutterworth. Here, John Wycliffe was born. From here, Thomas Cook organized his first tour. And here too, in a disused foundry, a little company set out to bring the idea of the jet to roaring life. Here, Whittle and his associates started up the age of the gas turbine, and in so doing, embarked on the inventor's long road of discouragement and danger. <laughs> 